What's up? Hey, today I'm sharing my experience with the low FODMAP diet. A couple months ago, I shared this video where I talked about some issues I was having with my digestion, with bloating. I wasn't really sure what was causing it, where it came from. I had some hunches, I had some ideas, but I, I didn't really know. I just knew that my symptoms were getting worse and the bloating was not going away. So I did some research. I came across a low FODMAP diet. I figured, why not? Let's give it a go. Flash forward to now, I have learned so much about this diet. I've learned so much about myself. So I figured I'd make an update video just kind of sharing my low FODMAP experience, like what it is, who it's for, how it works, what I've learned, my results, all that jazz. So if you're ready to get started, make sure to shoot me a thumbs up and maybe comment down below if you tried the low FODMAP diet, if you're currently doing the low FODMAP diet, if you've been curious about the low FODMAP diet, but kind of like on the fence about it, just comment down below. Before we get into it, I want to thank Audible for partnering on today's video. Something I'm going to get into later on on is stress and how it affects your digestion, but long story short, listening to an audiobook or listening to a sleep program before bed can be a welcome change from scrolling social or being glued to your computer all day. I know these past few months I've been spending a lot more time at home, a lot more time with Jeff, like just us and the dogs. So hearing someone else's voice, anyone else's voice can be a welcome change, can make things feel a little bit more normal, can make me feel a little bit more sociable. Audible has also just launched a new site at stories.audible.com where anyone, anywhere can stream hundreds of titles completely free, no membership required. It is an ad-free experience. You don't need to download an app. You don't need to sign in. You don't need to log in. You just click stream and listen. So if that's something that you think you'd be interested in, go to www.audible.com slash Abby Pollock or text Abby Pollock to 500-500 to get one free audiobook, unlimited Audible originals, as well as a 30-day free trial. So what is the low fog? map diet. By definition, a diet describes what you eat. It does not describe how much you eat. It does not describe your goal in eating this way. None of that. FODMAP is an acronym that stands for fermentable, oligo, dye, monosaccharides, and polyols. This is a group of carbohydrates that are especially hard to digest. And so when your gut bacteria digest them and eat them, they produce gas and this can cause digestive upset in some people. So the idea of the low FODMAP diet is that by reducing the amounts of these foods that you eat, you should be able to reduce these symptoms. Symptoms. This elimination diet strategy is not unique to the low FODMAP diet. More broadly, it's often used for identifying food sensitivities and intolerances. The idea is that by removing the foods that you think may be triggering your symptoms, then reintroducing them one at a time, you should be able to pinpoint what causes symptoms versus what doesn't. The low FODMAP diet is not designed to be a weight loss or weight gain diet. Of course, if you are having symptoms in response to eating high FODMAP foods, your body will change in the process, but that is not the main goal of this diet. The main goal is to identify what is causing your symptoms, reduce these symptoms, and then develop a long-term strategy for how you're eating so you can manage your symptoms or you know live symptom-free. That would be the goal. So why did I try it? The low FODMAP diet is typically recommended for those with IBS or IBS-like symptoms, which I was definitely struggling with before. This is uncomfortable to share. I wouldn't normally share this because I normally film on good digestion days when I'm feeling good, but this was maybe after two meals I had pushed back eating until later in the day. I'd just been sipping herbal tea and water, like doing everything that I thought was right for my digestion. This type of thing wasn't uncommon. So I just kind of got into a routine of pushing back my eating until the end of my workday or until the end of the filming portion of my workday, which I don't recommend. I don't think you should fast that long. I, I think you should probably be eating more frequently than that. It was kind of tricky because I knew the moment I ate, it was likely that this was gonna happen, that I was signing up for this, you know, feeling uncomfortable, feeling sluggish, feeling tired, feeling like I had to go to the bathroom, but I couldn't. So in terms of justifying a diet change, yeah, these symptoms weren't fun. They were definitely affecting my quality of life and I was willing to try anything that might make a difference. If you would like to learn more about the science behind this, like the scientific basis for the diet, how it works, where it came from, definitely comment down below and maybe we can get an expert on like in a future video. So how does it work? The low FODMAP diet can be broken down into three phases. The first phase is the elimination phase. It is exactly as it sounds. We are eliminating all high FODMAP foods from our diet and replacing them with a low FODMAP alternative so that we can get to a like a place or a baseline of no or 
with significantly reduced symptoms. This phase will typically take between two to six weeks. It really depends on your adherence. I know that I made some mistakes in my first couple of weeks, so I didn't actually remove all high FODMAP foods. Um, so it just kind of depends how quickly you can get into the routine of eliminating and substituting those and getting to a baseline of no symptoms. It is recommended that you do this phase under the guidance of a healthcare professional as it can be really easy to eliminate the foods but forget to substitute in low FODMAP foods which can lead to under eating, nutrient imbalances, or just developing a less than healthy attitude towards food. Phase two is the reintroduction phase. So this is where we get to test high FODMAP foods one at a time to see if they trigger symptoms. This phase does take longer, typically in the six to eight week range, because you wanna reintroduce foods one at a time so that you're reducing the number of variables. You can really pinpoint if that food causes symptoms or not. You'll then also wanna test different portions of that food to see if there's a threshold of a high FODMAP food that's gonna cause symptoms. And then after you've tested a food, you're gonna to wanna to take a few days to reset in between to get back to that baseline of like no or significantly reduced symptoms. So it does take a bit longer Longer. This is the phase I'm currently on. It's honestly pretty tough, but it is what it is. And then phase three is the integration phase where we get to take everything that we learned from phases one and two and incorporate it into our long-term eating plan. So including the high FODMAP foods you tolerate well, avoiding the, the high FODMAP foods you don't tolerate well, and then continuing to listen to your body so you can refine this over time. So what did I learn and what were my results? For reference, this is me before going low FODMAP, during a flare up, a bad digestion day, not feeling good and here is me now sticking to the low FODMAP diet not doing anything too wild and feeling a whole lot better beyond just the physical or visible changes though the way that I feel is night and day I am waking up energized I'm no longer feeling anxious over my food choices wondering like what the heck is gonna happen I'm no longer getting that painful bloating or painful pressure in my lower abdomen I'm able to go to sleep tired and actually fall asleep quickly instead of tossing and turning and beyond that even like an unexpected but really exciting benefit of this is the impact that this diet has had on my running I love running of course I train a variety of different ways but running is my anchor it is like my mental and physical anchor and something I noticed when I started struggling with my digestion was that the moment I'd start running I would feel the sudden and unexpected urge to go to the bathroom now thankfully I have a treadmill at home I'm very lucky with that but it would be like on the treadmill on the toilet on the treadmill on the toilet on the treadmill on the toilet which not only was it irritating but it was really discouraging because I was showing up every morning like ready to run ready to do the thing trying to do the thing and it's like my body just wouldn't cooperate with me. So since switching to the low FODMAP diet, I have not had to use the bathroom once during a run, not even during my first half marathon that I ran on the treadmill, by the way. So it's like, it's such a win and I'm really excited about that. Right now I'm in the early stages of the phase two reintroduction phase, which I have to say is ending up being a lot more difficult than I thought it would be. Um, I thought phase one would be the toughest because you're eliminating all high FODMAP foods. But I think what makes this tougher is that in phase one, you get that instant win, right? It's like you drop the low, you drop the high FODMAP foods and boom, you remember what it's like to not be bloated and to actually feel good again. But in phase two, you're so excited to add back in foods until you realize you have to be super, super controlled about it. And it's not because foods are scary or bad or you're afraid of particular foods. It's because in order to reduce the number of variables in this experiment and really pinpoint what causes symptoms versus what doesn't, you have to reintroduce one food at a time, starting in a very small portion, then gradually easing that portion up as you may have different like threshold tolerances to different foods. So that's the first challenge. The other big challenge is understanding that what you eat is not the only variable that's going to affect your digestion. How often you eat, how much you eat, how much you sleep, your quality of sleep, stress, all these things that you may or may not have habits around managing going into the low FODMAP diet that can have very real impact on your digestion and can skew your interpretation of the results that you're getting. Something I know I struggle with is stress management. Stress directly impacts your digestion by reducing transit through the small intestine, increasing inflammation, decreasing nutrient absorption, and making you more bloated and more gassy regardless of whether you have IBS or IBS-like symptoms or not, 
stress is not good for your digestion and I have not been good at dealing with stress these past couple months. So before I move forward with phase two, I'm gonna kind of backtrack or press pause for a little bit to just work on my stress management. Like the reality is that there will always be things beyond your control. There are always gonna be stressors in our life. That's just part of life. And we can't always control those things, but we can control the boundaries we set and how we react to those stressors. So that's my big focus. I'm hoping that by taking some time now to focus on that, when I go back to phase two, when I start reintroducing foods again, um, it'll just be a little bit easier to pinpoint what causes symptoms versus what doesn't. So did the low FODMAP diet work? It's working for me. I am not perfect. I have not been perfect with this. I'm not trying to be perfect with this. My goals going into this diet were to reduce my symptoms and become more aware of what triggers my symptoms so that I can better manage them day to day. There are many reasons why this diet may or may not work for you, but one thing that I haven't really seen covered a ton in the low FODMAP info I found online is the mental side of starting a new diet regime. I will be the first to say that I have not always had a healthy relationship with food. Food is really, really tough. Food is more than fuel. And so by eating clean or adhering to a specific dietary regime that you deem better, that does not, that's not like fueling with premium. While food is a physical necessity, many of us have complex mental and emotional relationships with it. And I get that when you're looking at other people's diets online, it can be really difficult to look at those objectively and not compare them to our own. The reason I'm sharing my experience with this diet is because I want to be honest with you, like this is something I'm trying because I think it has the potential to improve my quality of life. I'm not trying to lose weight with it. I'm not trying to gain weight with it. Like I'm doing this to feel better. And I don't want you to be wondering like why my meals look a little bit different or, you know, why I'm doing things a little bit differently right now. Trying this diet does not make me better or worse than you. Following any diet does not make me better or worse than you. There does not need to be any sort of moral attachment to a diet. It's not a competition. It's not a suggestion. It is literally just what I'm trying. I know that I can trust myself to not demonize or develop fear around certain foods if I temporarily remove them from my diet. I'm not devastated by eating a bit less of a certain food or cutting it out altogether. I love food. I appreciate food. I love finding new foods and experimenting with new foods, but I do not get upset if I am without a certain food. So if you've been thinking of trying the low FODMAP diet or any other dietary change for that matter, and you're in a good place with food, that would be a prerequisite. Try it out, see it through. It might just work for you. I'm not saying that the low FODMAP diet is the answer to any of what you're struggling with. It's something I tried out. It's working for me so far, but I think that it's good to know, like if you are struggling with these symptoms, there is hope, there is support out there. This might just be one place to start.